about, uh, I'd like to welcome everybody. We have about uh, a dozen people here in Brittany and uh, a couple of you at the SJU. This is the next in a series of closeout meetings for a work package project. We've done 10 or 11 of them so far. We have a few more to go. This one is on uh, a project which is a little different from all the others actually because it addresses liability impact of automated systems. It's been done by a group from uh, European University Institute and Deep Blue. We welcome Professor Giovanni Sarto, Giuseppe Contessa and Paola Lanzi, who's separated from them somehow. Um, in principle, we have one hour for presentation uh, and then time for questions after that. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to you, uh, uh, Giovanni. Thank you very much, Colin. Let us start with the presentation uh, of the um, final results uh, of the ALIAS project. ALIAS, um, as uh, Colin said, means addressing liability impacts of automated systems. Let me first start uh, with uh, a couple of slides uh, which provide somehow uh, the rationale of our project. So let us see first uh, a negative example and then, uh, and then a positive one. Do you know this vehicle? It is the Eurohawk, which is an unmanned aerial vehicle developed for the German Ministry of Defense. It was funded and successful text flights were made, but in the 2013 the German Defense Minister stopped the project because there were massive problems in obtaining flight permits in the U.S. place. This shows how if legal issues are not addressed at early time at the design space, then problems may emerge that may even require not deploying an already developed project. Now let us move to the good example. This is a Google driverless car. It was developed by Google with a considerable investment and Nevada and other states issued laws that allow for driverless vehicles to be tested in public street and also for running there. Maybe Google has good lobbying capacities, but this shows how if legal issues are addressed at an earlier stage, then this facilitates the deployment or even makes possible the deployment of, of a technology. And this is the main motivation behind the ALIAS project. We want the legal issues and in particular liability issues to be addressed at an early stage during the design of a new concept so that the concept may be adapted to the legal requirement and if problems are to be addressed, that can be done at an earlier time. So the Alios project started in May 2001 and is finished in October 2013. Its purpose is to research on liability attribution and distribution with regard to highly automated technologies and in particular ATM. Two partners, the European University Institute, which I am representative, and Deep Blue, which is here represented by Paolo Lanzi. There are two main outputs, which I will present in detail, the legal case and the network of legal research in ATM. And I will also say a few words about two other important documents we produced, framing the problem and case-based analysis and modeling. So this slide shows you the main results of the ALIAS project. So we have a deliverable framing the project, which sets the scene for the rest of the project, providing the background for it. Then we have case-based analysis and modeling, which on the basis of an extensive collection and analysis of a number of cases involving accidents, try to develop a framework for addressing legal liabilities in aviation law. Then we have the legal case, which is the core of the project, the methodology to address legal issues in automated technologies at the design stage. And finally, the network of legal research in ITM, which is uh, an online community supporting uh, by a website uh, where uh, material can be shared and uh, issues can be discussed. As you see from the arrows appearing, uh, framing the program, the case-based analysis and modeling and the network of legal research have uh, all provided inputs for uh, the legal case, which as I said, uh, is the core outcome of the project. Let us now say a few words uh, on these other main uh, results of the project. Uh, framing the problem um, uh, provides an analysis uh, of the impact of automation on socio-technical system 
in particular, what are the implications of automation as far as responsibility and legal liabilities are involved. Then there is an analysis of the regimes in different countries and different legal systems and a discussion of certain core areas such as software, autonomous automated systems and organizational liability, which is the liability not of individual operator but of the organization, the company or the structure in which they work. And then we have gone deeply into the analysis of the legal framework for liabilities in air traffic. The result, as I said, of this first deliverable, which we have continued updating during the whole project, is a framework for organizing and analyzing liability cases and an analysis of the theoretical basis and of specific issues involved in legal liabilities and cases and topics more generally for feeding also the network, for stimulating and directing the discussions on our network. Another important deliverable that we produced is a case-based analysis and modeling. There we started with collecting a number of accidents and discussing their legal implications, especially when court proceedings and also legal analysis have been produced. And these cases are not only some air traffic accidents in aviation, we consider in particular the Uberlingen case, the Linate case, but also cases involving maritime transportation, atomic power plants, and we try to extract the general trends that we can see in these diverse areas. This has enabled us to identify connection with different kinds of failures and classify the legal issues emerging from failures. In some subsequent slides, this will be shown. We also have developed a model for connecting error accidents and actors and liabilities, and we have applied this model to aviation. The results, we have various analyses and classifications that then have been used in the legal case and in the various supporting tools that we have developed for the legal case. Another result of the project is the network of legal research in ATM is an online community which is supported by a website. It's a community of about 150 experts that meet, uh, discuss and share documents online. It's very small but uh, you can see in this side of the slide, these are the posts. So there are posts on various issues. We have discussed in particular some accidents. For instance, we had an important uh, and judicial decision such as the one that was um, in Cagliari where air traffic controllers were criminally punished for having allowed visual approach when landing in Sardinia. This lower part of the screen shows our library where you can have access to various content. The purpose of the network is to support active participation and belonging. In particular, we have a library, as I said, which collects various documents, in particular on legal matters related to aviation law, and there are links with other libraries, both technical libraries such as Skybury and also legal libraries containing various legal materials pertaining to aviation. Let us now move into the legal case, which as I said is the core of our project and the main output we have delivered. What is the legal case? Now we start a bit at an abstract level. It is a novel methodology to address legal issues of automatic technologies for air traffic management during their design process. It includes a standard process, which I will present in the next slides, to identify legal liabilities, as I said, at the design stage, where a concept is been produced in the structured way so the concept problems, legal problems and liabilities are addressed before the concept is then deployed. In this way, convenient adaptation legal arrangements can be adopted before deployment. There are a variety of supporting tools such as tables, flow diagrams, reports which we have provided to facilitate the process. What are the principles of the legal case? The first principle that we followed is the idea that we say design according to liability or to legal issues. When a new concept is designed, legal liabilities and more generally legal issues should be addressed at that stage in a coherent and comprehensive way so that problems emerging at the later stage will not stop the deployment of the technology. Which is why we argued for a proactive approach. We should take an anticipatory perspective 
That is, usually we face a legal problem only when we are a judicial case. Therefore, the problem has already emerged and the issue is how to face the judge and succeed in convincing the judge that we are right. But a different approach is also possible. We should anticipate problems and try to avoid them from the very beginning. This is the risk management perspective that we think should be adopted also with regard to legal problems. Then a socio-technical approach to liabilities as you well know, there is now a big debate where the approaches adopted by judges are opposed to what the just culture would require. In many cases, legal decisions have been criticized for failing to understand the embeddedness of the activity of the operators in an organizational and more generally socio-technical structure. We want to focus this domain and we hope that the approach that we are proposing will also promote more awareness by the legal culture of the socio-technical dimension of accident and therefore of liabilities. Our approach is multidisciplinary. We assume that in the team that uses the methodology there will also be a legal expert but also experts in technology and in human factors. These competencies need to be integrated and we view our legal case also as a communication tool to facilitate the interaction between these different kind of skills of competence. Standard case-based approach, our idea is that the legal case should complement the other available cases, in particular the safety case, the human factor case and the human performance assessment process and it should also be consistent with the generic transversal area assessment process of Cesar so they can be applied to similar cases in different areas. Moving on, here you have the four steps in which we suggest that the legal case should be applied. First of all, there is the need also for the legal expert to understand the ITM concept, which requires collecting background information, identifying the level of automation and possible failures. Once that the concept has been understood, the following step requires identifying liability issues. Given the nature of the concept and the possible failures, what kind of risks are there that legal problems may emerge when the concept is deployed? These issues have to be examined on the basis of the legal regulation which is applicable. After that, legal analysis need to be performed, which means the risk now is being identified, we know what norms can be violated and what liabilities may follow, therefore we try to anticipate how these risks may be avoided or at least controlled. This may require changes in the technology or devising appropriate legal measures, for instance by entering contracts which reallocate the liabilities by taking insurance or possibly also by expressing needs for changing the regulation to the competent authorities. And finally, the results are collected and integrated in a document. Sorry to interrupt, uh, yes. I have a problem of vocabulary. Uh, what's the difference between uh, liability risk and legal, legal risk? Uh, legal risk is more general, the kind of problems that may emerge. Liability, uh, the idea of liability focuses uh, on being subject to an obligation to compensate for the damage, civil liability, or possible to criminal punishment. A legal risk which is not a liability may be the fact that uh, there is a, simply a prohibition to use the technology, as in the case uh, we have seen uh, of the Eurohawk. It was not a problem liability, it was a problem just a prohibition to, to fly with the uh, remotely piloted uh, aircraft. But then I will go into detail in the, in, the, in the next slides. Here we have the four outputs of the legal case being delivered at the four steps that we have just seen. The first step delivers a description, understand the concept, delivers a description of the relevant aspects of the concept, which also include the identification of the various tasks which the different operators have to accomplish. Then the second step identifies the liability issues, provides for the connection between damages and the potential legal issues and risks. Then the third step involves providing 
providing uh, measures for making the liabilities acceptable and sustainable. And finally, the document collects uh, recommendations and proposals for change. We will go into detail, uh, we will see these steps in, in more detail in the next uh, slides. This is the general flow of the process. You can see the steps of the process, which starts by collecting the background information, then the identification of the level of automation, possible failures, and then the flow goes into step two, identification of liability risks, examination of the legal risks, performing the legal analysis, and finally collecting findings and producing results. In the next slides, this is going to be illustrated in detail. Okay, let us now go into step one and have an in-depth look into this first stage of our process. This step has the purpose of collecting the relevant information. It provides an understanding of the concept being used. For instance, the concept may be remotely piloted aircraft or it may be remote tower, control towers, etc. At this stage, we provide an understanding of the concept focusing on the scope of the technology is used in the operational context and the impacts on the allocation of tasks, roles and responsibilities and possible failures. As you can see, the idea is that there should be an integration between the legal case and the other cases. For instance, the human performance assessment report should be used as an input at the first stage while the safety report should provide an input at the stage where possible failures are identified. Here you can see the supporting table that we have designed in order to collect technical information and also legal information about the new concept. We have also an instantiation of these tables. There is not the time to show it because we have made a first attempt to apply our methodology to ACAS, which has been our first broad trial for our methodology. The second sub-step involves identifying levels of automation. For this purpose, we suggest suggest using the level of automation table, the LOA table, which was developed by Cesar Project 16.5.1. Here you can see a bit of the LOA table. What we did was to develop an extension of the LOA table, which we called Air LOA, which means Responsibility LOA, which consists in, as you can see from the slots, of complementing the LOA table with the specification of the tasks that users have in connection with different levels of automation. So the idea is that as automation increases there is a change in the task of the users, of the managers and of the system. Maybe we can also see the whole of it but it's a bit risky. Uh, Okay, I think this is this is the whole of the load table, as you air load table, sorry. And uh, as you can see, we cannot go in detail, but the idea is that uh, um, tasks of users, managers, and systems change. And in this table, we have connected the change in level of automation to this change in the allocation of tasks. Why is it relevant? It is relevant because certain legal liabilities, in particular liabilities connected with negligence, are related to the fact that a certain task has not been accomplished or has not been accomplished in an adequate way. Therefore, by identifying the level of automation the related tasks, we are guided to identifying possible failures either in the human performance or in the organization or in the system. Let us move now to the following step, step which involves identifying possible failures. For our project we have designed sets, we call them maps, graphical representations, which help to identify the various components of our assessment and also we hope will facilitate communication between the lawyers, the legal component and the technical and human factor component involved in the team that makes the assessment. We have used this map methodology and we have various maps. We have classification maps for failures, damages and risks and then we have argumentation maps for legal analysis, legal design and also for addressing the insurance. A point of the maps is that they establish a link with similar representation models that are used in other cases and in particular in the safety case. Here you have an example just of a bit then the is a further development of the map but here we have to remain at an abstract level so failures are distinguished in organizational, technical latent condition, technical active error, human active error and then there is still subsequent development of the analysis. So the basic
basic idea is that on the basis of this classification of failure, it should be possible to identify and classify possible failures, producing a table of the kind that is shown in this slide. Okay, let me move on now to the next step. So we have now concluded the first abstract step of the process, which is understanding the ATM concept. We move now to the second step. We have understood what is the concept and we have an idea of what failures may emerge when the concept is deployed. Now we identify liability issues. As you see, we have our risk liability maps that are the output of the previous step. We construct the risk liability maps in order to identify legal risks. We also have damage liability maps, we show them later. We establish the liability risks and then we go into the legal analysis and we understand under what conditions these liabilities may arise. What are the legal grounds for these liabilities? In the end, we have an idea of what legal problems may emerge from the deployment of this technology. This step is very important, it's a key step because we need to connect the technical information concerning possible failures that we got in the first stage with a legal analysis. This is an example of what we call damage liability maps. Again, it is very small, so I don't think it is visible, but the purpose of these maps is to link the risk of a failure to the risk of a possible legal liability that may concern criminal law, may concern private law, and there is a detailed analysis which is developed. Again, in the outcome of this analysis, we have identified the risk that there is a particular kind of liability. At this point, we express, we report the result in the supporting table. Now we move into the real legal analysis. There you have the example of a legal analysis map. For instance, we have understood from the previous map that there may be what we call an organizational liability. At this point, we have to uh, distinguish the various heading under which an organizational liability may take place. On this slide, what is the main message which you want to, what is it important from this legal risk map? We have identified in the previous map that there can be a liability for the enterprise and this, uh, and this map gives you the condition under which an enterprise may be liable. So there may be what we call organizational liability, which uh, uh, may consist in a harm to a legally protected interest or uh, uh, deriving from the activity uh, processes or the which derives from the activity. This is a con this, all these conditions must be present uh, with the rights from activities or processes of an enterprise, uh, and there must be a causal link between the activity and the harm and uh, the uh, inadequacy in the operational activity of the processes. And this is the case when the harm could have been prevented by reasonable investment to improve the safety and security of the product of the activity, which happens when the activities do not meet the best organizational and technical standards or when the cost of taking adequate production precautions sorry, to avoid the harm would have been inferior to the expected cost of the injury. So now uh, we have assumed that we have identified a possible problem in the uh, technology, for instance a component which has a certain high uh, probability of uh, or even a limited probability of failing and if we can assess that uh, it is the case that uh, um, these conditions are made with regard to that component, we know that there is the possibility that a legal liability may emerge when the component is deployed in, in the tool. Then here we have the case of vicarious liability, which is the liability of the enterprise for the fault which is committed by an employer in the course of the employment. And then you have also um, cases of liability of an enterprise for technological risk, for product liability, or for statutory negligence. And uh, we have other maps that provide the conditions under which, for instance, an enterprise may be liable for product liability. These maps uh, 
obviously are general and they may have to be integrated with particular information concerning certain particular national law or certain particular kind of product, but they would guide the examination of whether um, given the way in which the concept is designed, uh, there is the possibility that uh, one of these uh, um, liability is incurred when uh, the concept is deployed. This is an example of um, what we call legal analysis map. So given the possibility that there is a liability, we check uh, what are the legal grounds for incurring in this liability and then we have to assess uh, what are the chances that this ground are satisfied with regard to the technology that we are considering. This is, for instance, a similar map that develops the idea of product liability, which expands one of the nodes of the previous map. Just to point you one aspect of these maps, in these maps you have the grounds, for instance, for incurring in product liability, and this red uh, shows uh, uh, an exception. For instance, um, the fact that the product, uh, even if the product uh, has caused the damage, the fact that the product was developed uh, on the basis of the existing state of the art uh, is an exception that uh, makes so that there will be no product liability even though the product uh, was uh, dangerous. But at the state of the art, this was not uh, avoidable or perceivable. So these maps uh, integrate the condition for having a legal effect with the exceptions when uh, these effects will not be the case even though other conditions are satisfied. On the basis of this legal analysis map we can assess whether there may be grounds for liability in future cases involving the deployment of the technology. I don't know, we have to test this to a larger extent, but I think that these kind of maps may be also a good language to communicate legal concepts in a very condensed way also to technical experts, because somehow they reflect the kind of and or diagrams or similar maps that are used for modeling software software or the working of various devices. Again, this is the supporting table where the outcome of step two is going to be represented. So you have the stakeholder, the condition for the liability, the kind of liability, for instance, product liability, the risk that this liability will take place, and also what uh, may be done to, uh, to prevent it. Now we move into step three of the methodology, which concerns performing the legal analysis. The input will be provided by the step two, so now we know what kind of legal problems uh, may emerge when the technology is deployed, and maybe also the idea of legal risk. What are the chances, even though in a very fuzzy way, what are the chances that a particular kind of liability is incurred. We have to see whether this is acceptable to all parties. Maybe a certain kind of liability is not acceptable, for instance, for the software developer. The software developer says, I cannot accept the liability for any damage that may arise from the use of my software. And therefore, the software developer may require the user of the software to exempt the developer from a liability, at least towards the user, in case, uh, for instance, an economic damage that is caused by the fact that the software is not performing properly. An important issue is the issue of insurance. Usually there is a complex regulation dealing with insurance in aviation. There are obligations to take insurance up to certain amounts, but there is also a space for a contractual arrangement concerning insurance, so that by taking an insurance, a further issue would be who is going to pay the insurance, the cost of the insurance, certain risks may become acceptable. This is an example of another map, which we call the legal design maps, and is built on the basis of the legal analysis maps that we have shown at an earlier stage. Here the purpose of the design map is that we should link to the liability map the possible measure that may be taken in order to make these liabilities sustainable, acceptable for all the involved parties. If there is a product liability, the manufacturer should cover the cost of the liability being liable. However, 
if we take an insurance, then we have uh, that uh, the insurance will indemnify the manufacturer so that the manufacturer in the end, uh, while being liable, will not cover the cost of the insurance. But this will have the, the consequence that the manufacturer has to pay an insurance policy. Again, uh, we may find uh, some other party which takes the cost uh, of the insurance uh, policy. For instance, with regard to software, the user rather than the manufacturer may, may, uh, may cover the cost of the insurance. Maybe uh, there is a limitation clause again uh, and if there is a um, liability limitation clause uh, then uh, for instance uh, if the airline includes uh, in the contract with the software developer a liability limitation clause uh, then uh, uh, there will be no compensation for the damage to the airline on the basis of, of this uh, limitation clause or uh, there may be an agreement instead uh, to strengthen the liability of the producer for instance according to the, uh, to the law as it is understood, but uh, no, as we have seen in the Uberlinger case, in the recent Barcelona judgment, judges are uh, quite uh, sometimes um, uh, take uh, peculiar decisions, but uh, if the product had the design defect, usually there is uh, uh, the state of the art exception according to which there is no liability. However, again, the, on the opposite uh, side, the user of the technology may not be happy with that and may establish that the state of the art exception cannot be invoked to, uh, for the manufacturer to avoid liability. So the manufacturer should be, uh, should be liable for all damages uh, caused by the product, even those that, that uh, result from uh, failure in the technology, but uh, uh, the technology was developed uh, according to the state of the art. So uh, these, uh, uh, these which we called, sorry, these kind of maps uh, have the purpose of uh, uh, showing how, uh, what uh, is possible to do to, um, through legal measures, through insurance uh, clauses, li uh, limitation clauses and other legal measures to change uh, the allocation of liability and therefore the allocation of the costs uh, that uh, would result uh, from, uh, from an accident. This would be the legal design map which results from enriching uh, with these further boxes uh, the legal analysis map. This is another kind of map which is called insurance map. Here we have just a map which pictures the various possibilities that there are for insurance. Insurance is a very important legal measure for redistributing the risk of accident but also the risk of incurring liabilities. This map is just a taxonomy of the different kinds of insurance that can be taken. Now we have performed the legal analysis, we have established what can be done, there may be various proposals. For instance, the software manufacturer may say, I want uh, that my liability is limited or excluded. The user may say, no, I don't agree with that. You have to bear the risk. They may decide to take an insurance or not to take it, and they may decide who is going to pay for that. So there is going to be proposals and possibly an agreement on acceptance of the proposal or its rejection. And there may be comments. At that point, the analysis has been completed and we can move to the, collect the findings of the analysis and to write the final report which synthesizes the result and presents them. This picture is again the general flow of the process, but there are included two gates which are meant to identify the points where there may be a check on the results of the project to decide whether and how to move on. This flow chart shows that we are in step one, analyzing the concept. If the information is not enough, obviously we cannot move on and we have to go back to step one, restarting the process. If it is okay, we move to step two and then uh, to the third step, which consists in we perform the legal analysis, then we move into the third step so, and then we check whether the design measures that were identified are okay, if they have been accepted or whether there is still a disagreement among the parties on how to allocate the liabilities resulting from the concept. And if everything is okay, the legal case is concluded, otherwise we have to reconsider and move back to the previous steps. Why do we have execute step 4? If you don't have enough information or if you didn't? Because just you, you, you produce a report anyway saying that uh, uh, we, we have not uh, been able to reach an agreement. Uh, this time uh, we should restart uh, and see whether we... 
mainly to collect uh, recommendations. If you are not able to conclude step one because you were not able to collect all the relevant information, in step four you will have a recommendation to get specific, the specific information that you missed. So as soon as you have a more complete picture, you can restart. So step one, as I said, is collecting the information. And uh, yeah, again, the idea is that when there is a failure, a recommendation should be issued in any case on how to move on. Step two, identify the liability issues. Step three, uh, perform legal analysis. And uh, again, if the outcomes are not satisfactory or not agreed upon, then there should be a document of recommendation on how to move on. And obviously, if uh, instead an agreement is reached, then uh, the legal case uh, can be considered uh, to be completed. This is just a template uh, in which uh, the final results of the projects uh, are going to be presented. So it's just a document template uh, on which to include the output. I think I've now completed my presentation of the legal case as it is now. This is the presentation of the legal case uh, where we stand. The foundational analysis has been completed. We have uh, this full version um, which is now available. We have also made uh, a first application of the legal case to the ACAS case to some extent. We have also tested the legal case to some small examples, but we have also kind of fuller examples already accomplished. The network is online and uh, we have a community discussing legal issues of ATM. We had uh, continuous activity on the network in the last months. Obviously, some stimulus is required. We can do better, but there is still uh, significant uh, activity going on. What to do next? We need to test and consolidate the legal case and we need also to expand the network and make most um, of its potentiality. So I think there is much to be done, but we have already a solid uh, basis uh, on which to build. The way forward uh, will be ALIAS 2, a continuation of the ALIAS project, which aims at uh, grounding, applying, refining and consolidating the legal case. Uh, the having uh, broad uh, testing and applications uh, will be decisive for this step. And then we want to provide training and coaching session for using the legal case in connection with new concepts so that it is adopted in the community. We want to develop also a set of better and broader supporting materials to the network platform and also to the training and coaching sessions. And we would like also to expand the ALIAS community, the ALIAS network, so that it becomes the place where stakeholders and projects may address liability issues, but also more generally also other legal issues in ATM. For this purpose, we want to supplement the online discussion with physical meetings, and in particular, we plan to hold an annual conference. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, questions, suggestions are as welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Giuseppe. Very nice presentations. I think we'll start off, as usual, by going to our friends in Brussels to see if they have any questions. Okay, we would start with our CESA re regulatory uh, expert. Okay, Mara. Good afternoon. I am Mara Dame from the CESA Regulatory Affairs. Um, I have the several questions regarding the presentation and as I'm quite new in the CESAR uh, and also didn't have the full documentation, I'm a little bit confused uh, about the scope of liability application because on the paper 6.2 liability in the traffic service in the EU regulation, you speak about the liabilities according to Chicago Convention and the um, Warsaw and Montreal. That's correct. And uh, the liability of service providers, acceptable. The liability of states and national supervisory authorities could be acceptable uh, in the Chicago framework. But then um, I'm a little bit lost because you also mentioned the manufacturing and then you have some, uh, of course, also the compensation funds for the aircraft. So what is kind of the scope you are looking for and who is included in the scope? I am a little bit me messed up. Who is included in the scope of the liabilities and legal case you are speaking about? All the stakeholders or uh, those who are uh, in the Chicago Convention? Or, um, yeah, it could be good that if you clarify that. Then um, on your presentation, I think it was a slide of five leading principles and then you said about the um, generic uh, trans trans 
uh, various areas assessment process of CESAR. Um, and you mentioned the human uh, performance and safety cases, and you didn't give more explanation on that. It could be very good if you explain what you mean in this slide. It was slide on the five leading principles, and it was the, I think, last point. Then in one of the slides, um, I think it was before the before um, failure maps, you mentioned common techniques of hazard identification. I would really appreciate to see those common techniques of hazard identification and where you taken those common techniques from or what is mean by that. So I have more questions, but probably that could be three main. The scope of liability, the, is it come go to the all stakeholders, and then some more explanation on your slides. Thank you. Please uh, um, uh, join me, Giuseppe and Paola, uh, to answer these questions. Uh, so uh, concerning uh, the kinds of liability, um, obviously, as you, as you know, in, in aviation law, you have uh, liabilities um, established uh, uh, by the uh, Chicago conventions concerning, uh, um, concerning uh, air, air companies. Then you have uh, uh, liabilities concerning uh, uh, damage uh, uh, on the ground. But then you have also the general rules on liability that, uh, concern, that, uh, that follow from, uh, from national law. For instance, uh, uh, rules uh, on product liability, on uh, uh, liability of uh, um, employees and employers, uh, organizational liability, then you have also um, uh, discipline in particular uh, um, uh, that you may have uh, uh, different also national regulation concerning criminal and civil liability. The idea is to take uh, all these kind of liabilities uh, um, uh, in consideration and uh, stakeholders uh, will be all those uh, that are involved in the development of a new concept. Uh, they will be a legal expert, uh, but then they will be uh, they will be also, depending on the type of concept, the users of the concept, uh, maybe um, air traffic uh, um, uh, control agencies, maybe uh, air, air companies, um, uh, uh, maybe also uh, consumers associations, depending on the type of concept that is being developed. But the idea is to examine all liabilities, not just those deriving from conventions, but also those uh, deriving from, uh, from national laws or for European laws as well, for instance, uh, uh, liability towards, uh, towards passengers. So the idea is to, um, uh, when uh, the concept uh, is developed, uh, the whole legal framework should be considered and all liabilities uh, uh, following from uh, that framework uh, should be addressed. We have also specific analysis concerning the liability resulting uh, from, uh, from the convention, uh, but I don't think we can go into this level of detail. Um, uh, at this stage. Uh, concerning, uh, uh, unless you want to, uh, concerning the, um, the leading principles, uh, your question referred, uh, I think, uh, to, the, to the standard. Ah, Paola, maybe is going to say something on that. Maybe I can start uh, yes. with an answer and you yes, can yes, integrate. Yes, um, your question is about uh, um, why. It was about the slide where you presented five leading principles yeah. and that was, this, I think, last bullet point. You uh, speak about the transversal areas assessment uh, process of CESAR. Yeah. I just wanted to know what you mean by the transversal areas assessment process. Uh, you know, it was the last bullet point in this slide. I think it's like a generic and case-based approach. Yeah, you know, this is... Um this is a CESAR project, so we try to be as coherent as possible with what CESAR is going in primary and transversal projects. And you know that uh, um, there is an attempt uh, within, our, within project 16 of CESAR to, to create a set of uh, cases that are in a sense coherent one with the others and integrated. And this is the reason why um, generic uh, transversal approach is proposed to be applied in the refinement uh, or in the creation of all the cases. This is also the reason why also the safety case, which is a quite consolidated case, uh, is going to be 
rearrange a little bit to be structured in the same way as the others. The same is going to happen with the human factor case which is which is being transformed into the HP assessment process. And uh, we really to want to be coherent with this kind of approach so and to be not uh, overlapping uh, or in contrast with the other cases. So we adopted the same structure, the generic structure that is proposed for all the cases. And, uh, and we tried in our process to identify the links with the other available cases, which at the moment are the safety case and the human factor case. This is because we don't want to be an isolated uh, uh, case in this environment, and also uh, because we think that uh, duplication of work is useless. So if, for instance, uh, the identification of failures is carried out in the safety assessment, uh, in the safety case assessment. If this kind of work has already been carried out, why not to take it directly when the legal case is applied, or vice versa? If the legal case is applied first, it can be an input for the safety case. And the same for the HP assessment process. The first step of our case is exactly in line with the first step of the HP assessment process and uh, depends on how the two processes develop, uh, one can be the input for the other and vice versa. Is this uh, answer enough for you? Thank you. And we have some more questions? I think the common techniques of hazard identification. I just wanted to have the source where you take that from and uh, is it regulation you take from or? You uh, your control material, sir. I think that for the for the classification of the risks uh, of the possible failures, we are in line with the um, uh, safety assessment guidance material of Eurocontrol. So, so we are applying. We are trying to keep our process as close as possible to 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 the process used by Eurocontrol. Okay, and uh, sorry, one point uh, I would like to mention to you. Um, we have, uh, uh, concerning the connection between, uh, there is a complex indeed connection, as you mentioned before, between uh, the um, uh, regulation of liabilities uh, in the uh, conventions and uh, what happens instead in national uh, law. And we have tried to address in particular uh, this aspect, uh, which I could not present uh, today in uh, um, at page um, uh, in the in the in the map uh, quite complex that you can see at page 52 of uh, of our of our deliverable so this is something that we have taken into account the uh, the specific impacts uh, of the conventions on the regulation of liability even though i could not develop it adequately here yes thank you i could just um on the liability, I was like really surprised that you said that you are taking into account all legal frameworks should be considered and also national laws. And uh, I guess it's uh, quite a lot of information. But then if you are doing so, I think most of the, audience, that the most liability issues, what uh, concerns them damage or uh, it also has been already description of those or stated in the European states uh, has the FAPS and all the state level agreements within the FAPS have the liability issues addressed. I guess most of them. I haven't read all, but I think the FABEC, uh, NIFAB, I think Danish Swedish FAB, they are all have the liability issues. So you could take that if you're taking like national legislation, I think it's worthwhile to take uh, all the FAB agreements as well because there is uh, liability issues tackled as well. Thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you very much for this for this suggestion. Thank you. Well, we have several more questions. I would just like to understand a little bit more how this legal case uh, fits into CESA as a whole. Um, do you think that's something essential and therefore it should be uh, put together with a safety case when we go towards deployment of CESA? Um, because if that's so important, we should really hurry. But I haven't seen anything like that in the work program at the moment. So it comes from work package E. How it's been uh, included in the in the full uh, CISO work work program, and how what is the its impact on uh, 
uh, deployment. Maybe Paola, what do you want to say? <laughs> what I can say is that this is a WP project, so it's a long-term and innovative research. We are trying to, to be coherent with CESAR in order to be integrated with the other activities that are going on. But uh, we are not able at the moment to foresee if this case will be mandatory or not. What we to be integrated in the overall business case uh, and with the other cases. What we can say for the moment is only that it has been designed to be able to be integrated in this framework, but we we don't have uh, for the moment the possibility to. Uh, to know if it will be used, applied. Uh, uh, of course, uh, w what is important from our point of view is to, to highlight that, okay, we are presenting to you a new methodology, but behind this methodology, there is uh, uh, an idea that is really new. The idea of taking into account the legal aspects in the design process. This is, this is something that is new. Because if you see even EOCVM, which has made an attempt to take into account the legal aspects and standardization and regulation, it takes into account these kind of aspects from V3. So it starts taking into account regulation and standardization when the concept is quite measured. We are, pr we are proposing to anticipate this kind of analysis so that you can understand since the very beginning if your uh, technology is going to have a showstopper because uh, there are problems of liability attribution or acceptability of the way the liability is distributed or because, as in the case of EUROC, um, you are, there is a, a legislation, a regulation that does not allow you at the moment uh, to apply your operational concept. And the idea behind this process is that maybe you understand since the very beginning that there is this kind of limitation and you can take into account uh, during your design process. I mean, you, you, you keep developing your, your rock but in the meantime, you are also aware that you have to work on the legislation side. And the case of the Eurooc is particularly interesting from this point of view because uh, this was something that a lot of people knew, that was on the newspaper, that was said by different people, but uh, uh, it's, it was not said in an official way. So it was not taken into account. The, the, the project of development of EUROC uh, continued and this idea that the regulation was not in line was completely ignored. I, I'm not saying that it was unknown, it was ignored and we think that having this kind of standard process can be a means uh, uh, to make it evident in a standard way. So well, it's having said that, you. Uh, w have you actually got any real cases where this has been applied to? And I think uh, the, the answer is you, you, know, you, you haven't gone end to end with uh, sort of enough real world cases yet to show how well uh, you know, the, the, the costs and the benefits of applying your methodology. Yeah. But maybe one of the proposals should be first, as explained, yes. to test your methodology to complete the primary project, but also to include uh, this case in the EOCVM methodology at the different uh, V maturity level. So, and maybe iterative yeah. way, I don't know, but to, to make the link and to yeah. complete uh, what has been done uh, with the safety case and the human performance case through EOCVM. You are right. We try to position the legal case in EOCVM for the moment and in Alias Second we have uh, a plan of performing two test applications, two proper test applications of the legal case on two technologies. One of them probably will be RPAS, the other one is still to be defined. So if you have ideas or suggestions, concepts that you think could be worth to be used to test the legal case and that also could benefit by the application of the legal case, feel free to propose because we are open to, to the proposals. 
Also, what I was a little bit surprised and uncomfortable with was the fact that you were asked, uh, you were saying that Alias 2 would uh, propose this uh, legal case and it will be adopted by the CNSATM community. No, it is not proposed. What kind of adoption is that? What is this community? What is? Why are we doing that? And again, once more, how does that fit to CISO deliverables? The idea is that we, through the test applications that we are performing in Alias Second, we will consolidate the methodology. And if the methodology is worth to be applied or receives the interest of people, we can start training people on its application applying to other concepts and it can be available for the community that's it yeah we hope that we will apply it as much as large as possible yes okay thanks another question is how much involvement with yasa has been done in this project yasa you mean yasa yasa sorry um i can tell you that IASA is uh, informally following uh, our work uh, with a lot of interest and uh, we have been to IASA to present our project and to present our, uh, the, our initial ideas on uh, the legal case one year ago and there was a lot of interest. They are not officially involved in the project but they are following our activities uh, and with, uh, with interest because uh, from their point of view this could be an interesting means for standardization and uh, improving also the, um, I have to say, the, the legal knowledge uh, in, in this environment, how to bring a standard view on the legal uh, domain. From your point of view, what are the lessons learned from Alias 1 for Alias 2? What are the lessons learned? and particularly in the context of long-term research. For sure, we learned that uh, there is a large interest in this topic. We had the feeling that it was like this when we started the project, but now we can see that this is um, that there are a lot of conferences, a lot of workshops that discuss on how to take into account liability issues and how to uh, bring the just, uh, the just culture into the legal domain. So uh, for sure what we can say is that uh, we started maybe uh, in the right moment uh, this project because now when we go uh, to those meetings or conferences or workshops, we are uh, considered uh, as people that have contents to share, new contents to share, and this is very good for us because uh, normally they discuss about conventions, uh, roles of organizations, uh, and uh, this kind of approach seems quite new in this environment. So we, we confirm that uh, we are well placed uh, within work package. So we are well placed in uh, long term and innovative research, I think. Uh, for sure, we also, we can also, we also learned, uh, but this is also a confirmation that uh, there is not a community that, uh, that takes into account this kind of issues. We made an attempt to build a community, but it's not so easy. You can, if you go to our network, you can see it is very heterogeneous. We have people from about, uh, we try to, to classify them, and at the end we had 10 different uh, categories of people, uh, depending on the organizations they belong to. So, so we are really starting to create a community, and this is not easy. Uh, to, to make people uh, uh, discussing on this topic because uh, it's, uh, they, they still have to create a, a common background, I think, and the maps that we proposed could be a way to, to make the legal aspects easier to understand for the technicians, but on the other side, the legal case can also be a means to, to bring the legal people in the projects, uh, the technical projects, so. Yes, if I can 
they can add uh, add uh, something. Uh, I think that um, in particular for the legal culture, uh, um, uh, possibly we can make some difference because uh, we, lawyers, also lawyers working in aviation, or they don't have uh, at all the idea that uh, the risk of uh, having legal problems should be anticipated uh, rather than uh, uh, the problem being faced uh, only after it has emerged. And also they have very little, at least um, uh, most of them, has very little awareness awareness um, of uh, what is happening uh, within uh, the safety culture and what are the organizational uh, and technical issues involved uh, in, uh, in accidents. Uh, and um, um, we have the impression that uh, um, also to the network uh, we, can make, um, we can make a change, uh, we can have an input also in the evolution of the legal discussion on these matters. And, uh, um, among the uh, future initiatives, uh, we are also uh, organizing um, 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 in collaboration with the Center for Judicial Cooperation, which is established uh, in Florence, uh, a conference involving judges uh, of different countries uh, and, and experts uh, on aviation uh, on the issue of the connection between uh, um, safety culture and adjudication on matters concerning liability. So I think that uh, uh, we can... Uh, we can make a difference to some extent. Right, uh, local questions. Chris. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. So. There's been a lot of automation introduced into the cockpit over the last few decades, and I was just with two human operators. I was just wondering, what is it about that legal framework which is different to the one you propose for the ground? With regard to automation, I think, first of all, uh, there must be awareness what is the legal framework, what is the existing legal framework. Automation, uh, it's uh, uh, making a, a difference uh, also with regard to the existing legal framework. Uh, it shifts uh, um, tasks and therefore liabilities from the operators to the uh, developers of the technology, of the technologies and of uh, and to those uh, who organize the framework where um, operators and technologies are going to interact. And uh, when you introduce a new technology, you have to be aware that this is taking place and therefore uh, to uh, take into account uh, how this change in tasks uh, involve uh, new kinds of liability, for instance, liability of the software developer, liability of the maintainer of the, of the software, and um, liability for the designer of the man machine interaction, and how this uh, is going to have uh, um, an impact then on possible future legal issues. So I think that uh, um, uh, it is not the case that uh, uh, we are always um, aware of these changes uh, and one of the purpose of the methodology that we are developing is uh, uh, exactly identifying uh, the changes produced by automation and what uh, uh, difference they make uh, with regard to legal liabilities. Uh, so there are two things that we, that we may want to do. One thing is uh, what happens according to the existing law if something does not work, uh, who is going to be liable according to existing law? And secondly, uh, uh, an idea may also be uh, suggest uh, possible changes uh, in, uh, in the regulation, but this is uh, uh, only to some extent within the scope uh, of the development of the Council because uh, it depends how much influence it may have with regard to the competent decision maker setting standards or setting rules. I think Chris is saying, haven't we already done this for the cockpit, for example? Haven't we had ah, these sorry, kinds so of discussions? We wanted to know whether we have already done our analysis. Uh, well, no, no, was no, no, no. in comparison no, no. With, with other things, for example, where the cockpit has become much more highly automated, haven't we had these discussions already? The idea is that we started uh, creating a methodology which is for ground concepts, but then we discover that uh, probably it, it can have a, a more uh, extended application, so um, properly updated, the same process and the maps uh, can be applied also to automations that concern the airborne side, and uh, a proof of this uh, is that um, we, in the last part of Elias, we went to several conferences presenting this methodology and also to um, conferences in which people from other transport domains or even from other safety critical domains as the healthcare, for instance, were involved. And they had a large interest in this methodology and they thought that uh, it could be in principle applied also in, other, in their domains and they also welcomed the methodology as a, 
as a way of uh, creating uh, best practices uh, among different uh, transport areas or different safety critical domains. The point is, I understand you, you may wish to apply then your methodology, but I think the initial question was before that. Uh, there is, I mean, the automation in the cockpit happened before on the ground side, and I believe automation also in other fields uh, appear or happen just largely before us. So the point is, uh, there have been automation introduced, and possibly the, this issue in terms of uh, liability or legality, and also in terms of methodology. So, what have you looked at what's been done previously? Okay. What are, in terms of state of the art, before developing a new one, did you consider what's being done before? Yes, yes. As a matter of fact, I di we did not go into that, but we have uh, considered also that this methodology may be applied uh, also to technologies that are already existing uh, to anticipate uh, uh, problems. We call it retroactive application of the legal case, but uh, in a way, we can apply it also to a technology which is already existing uh, to anticipate uh, what kind of problems may emerge from the technology which is already operational. And uh, now no, this is no, another no, question. No, it's my, not my question. It's not my question. I think let's read the other way around. Uh, automation has been introduced in the past. Okay. I guess I'm not an expert, so I guess that they have developed their own methodology. No, there's hardly anything out there already, and that's the point. And I think that the the approach to uh, liability, and I'm, uh, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, has been um, quite superficial. And in the implementation of technologies and automation, uh, the, the argumentation that's been made has not covered all the kinds of arguments that have been uh, presented here. They simply haven't. And then uh, after the accident, of course, after an event, they look back and try and work out what the, what the uh, uh, sequence of events was, what happened exactly. But in terms of a proactive approach, it's been very uh, superficial as far as I can understand. Uh, appreciates being done uh, later, which may be also the case for us. But in the end, for uh, on the cockpit, on on other fields, nuclear and so on, they came up. Has there, for example, been a legal case developed by the nuclear industry or the chemical industry? Is there anything like that that is is out there? There are studies, obviously, that have been made occasionally, but there is no general methodology. No, various studies have been made on on particular issues, but there is no general methodology that is being proposed for. Uh, um, anticipating all the kind of new, for addressing all kind of new um, uh, chemical methods or processes, uh, for instance. Uh. But, but what is it about an air traffic controller which is different to any other interaction between human and tool? Why do we need this? Why can't we just borrow somebody else's framework? The idea would be that uh, we have borrowed the idea from other frameworks, but uh, um, no, no, no. We have to start from somewhere, and since we have uh, air traffic control as a domain, uh, we can start from there, and then, as Paula said, we may see whether uh, this uh, uh, method uh, is, we, we believe that it's suitable also for other domains, such as automation in the cockpit, uh, or uh, uh, um, other areas, uh, uh, other kind of transports. Uh, um, uh, but uh, um, uh, the idea of having uh, a structured, a structured general method for approaching uh, in a proactive way liability issues, uh, I think is a valuable idea that can be exported uh, elsewhere. Uh, I would like to add something on this point. On the one side, we have uh, the fact that uh, we, we are going to have this paradigm shift on ATM. On the other side, from a legal point of view, we are seeing more and more legal decisions in which the current framework appears to be partially inad inadequate. Basically, the old idea that we have a channeling of liability in which uh, the, air, the air carrier or the air navigation provider, service provider, basically they, they compensate for uh, the damage. And this is, was the, like, the, the framework established by European international law, etc. It's not working very well. For example, we have a decision from uh, the, 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 very, the very old at this point, 10 years old, more than 10 years old, Uberlingen case, and you have two planes, two, two aircraft, uh, 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 a collision on the, on, on the sky uh, between uh, Switzerland and Germany, and then uh, you have a Spanish court using product liability law, not air law, 
and using U.S. law to decide it. French, so, if a French school bus crashed into a German school bus, why don't we use that framework legally? Because, because at this point, if you have a shift towards the producer, you have more and more chances that, uh, for example, you are going to have cases in which uh, the, 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 the relatives of the victim would, uh, for example, sue directly the producer of the technology. Those coaches have um, braking systems which have some automation in them which could go wrong, but there must be a whole legal free framework already established. You can read the deliverables actually yes. and, the, and the way, for example, the Uberlingen history is, is very, has been jumping from one country to another to another where they've looked uh, the, the, the people looking for compensation have gone to the court that they think will best offer them a deal and it's very complex. It ended up in, uh, in Barcelona for some reason which had no relationship to the original accident or the manufacturers or anything else for that matter. So it's very complex. Uh, can I just get one more question from uh, Laurent? Yeah, well, two but the first is very, very small. Is, uh, I mean, you, you suggest, and I do understand, that it's important to do uh, such a uh, legal issue analysis at the beginning, and I mean, it's better or as early as possible than as late. Uh, but was that performed on Caesar or not at all? Okay, so it's not at all just, because that was a short question. And then, uh, do we know, even if that was not done, do we foresee some legal issue on the consumption of the concept? Or we don't know or we foresee some might, might have problems. I can certainly foresee some in ACAS. I worked with them to give a, a practical example. With ACAS, the Barcelona Court of Appeal judgment gave $300 million, I think, judgment. Uh, this you know, back of an envelope calculation is approximately all of the uh, benefit, uh, the profit that has been made from producing all ACAS units. Uh, against, the, the the, against the manufacturers. So, you know, have we created something that uh, has this judgment basically made the uh, made it uh, not profitable to produce uh, collision avoidance systems? You know, that's uh, if you've got that situation, it's clearly unacceptable uh, because this has probably saved loads more accidents than the one that actually happened. Uh, you know, how institutionally is that going to be handled? Uh, how can we make sure that this uh, this type of uh, paradox doesn't occur uh, again in the future? Uh, and the same thing is, is about to come up in a new system, so there's new variants of ACAS that are going to be developed for UAS and uh, for, uh, uh, for small general aviation aircraft. In both of those cases, you know, how... You know, how are we going to develop the system in a way that uh, the manufacturers won't be unreasonably liable uh, for, uh, uh, for problems or situations where things go wrong? Yeah, thanks. I think this, is, uh, this captures a bit of the, the, the kind of use that uh, uh, can be made of the legal case. Uh, and also the results of the legal case can then be used, be, be, not be useful also if something may happen, may happen in the future. They may be useful when developing the concept and also at the basis on which you, be, you can build argument in the future when something happens. I would just like say, to say one thing. So, um, concerning the debate that we had before, uh, so in, uh, we believe that uh, now as for the instance the safety case uh, um, needed to be developed, uh, even though there are safety issues in many other domains, in the nuclear domain, uh, you consider that it was uh, worth developing a safety case for addressing safety issues in uh, in ATM, I think that that is the similar situation concerning the legal case. It is useful, I think, even though uh, many issues are common to other areas, um, it, is, it is useful to have uh, a structured process to address liability issues uh, in, the, in, a, in air traffic control. And uh, we believe that uh, it may become uh, also um, a pattern that can be transferred also to other areas. And this will be also something interesting to examine to what extent uh, this may be possible. So there may be a, a, a follow-up of this also in other domains. One point that I learned from working with, with you on this as well is that generally the, the legal issues have been uh, under-explored. Uh, that... Uh, uh, 
I found out about the Barcelona judgment and uh, some of the details of that and digging into it. Uh, you know, there were practical things where the courts weren't getting things right, you know, getting technical details wrong, uh, and there's a need for us, or a need for me to at least write a paper to correct some of the, the, the legal aspects that have been, in my opinion, very badly, badly done. Now, if that can happen in my area, I'm sure it can happen in a whole load of other areas as well. And uh, uh, I think that um, one message from this is generally we should be, we should start to be more interested in legal issues uh, with with ATM. That's a great point to close on, actually, isn't it? Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you for summing up uh, so well, Garfield. Um, we uh, thank you for this. We'll actually put all this on a video which Jean-Luc is uh, preparing, so this will be available. I don't know, going back to Sylvie's comment, whether anybody will want to apply uh, the, the approach, the methodology that's going to be uh, developed by Alias and refined in Alias 2. It's entirely up to um, César, the Commission and others to decide whether they want to pick it up or not. But. Um, uh, Obviously, as a WP project, one of our objectives is to produce stuff that will be used at some point. So, uh, forgive us for, for being optimistic about the future. That's 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 what we would like to happen in the future. Um, so, I'll say thank you to our presenters, and uh, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.